Thank you again. I apologize for being late. Uh, unfortunately, as, as many of you know, uh, for the past year we have been, uh, this year has been dedicated, among other sponsors, for a Rafua Shlema uh, for Binyamin Yisrael Ben Chanita, Binyamin Yisrael Chaim Ben Chanita. Uh, sadly, tragically, uh, our prayers have not been answered, and uh, this young man. Uh, did pass away. Uh, he died. Uh, I'm just coming back from the Levaya. The Levaya was in Eretz Israel, although he died in, in, the, in, the, in the U.S. And uh, what can you say when a 15-year-old uh, boy uh, dies of incurable cancer? Uh, I hope that God should give the family uh, the strength to go on and to rebuild and to remember the noble and good life uh, that Binyamin Yisrael lived. He only lived a few years, but in those years, uh, he did many, many mitzvahs. He put on tefillin, he davened, he learned Torah. He accepted the pain that God put into his life in good cheer and with faith and with bitachon. He had friends, he, lo he was loved by people. And uh, keep in mind as well that uh, in his merit, people did so many mitzvahs. So literally, thousands and thousands of people learned Torah, gave staka. Uh, all because of him. And in Shemayim, all of those mitzvahs go to his credit. Even now, uh, Carol and Ron, his parents, are sponsoring this year, I think even tonight, uh, not for a Shleim anymore, but Aliyat Neshama. So I think all of us, with a great deal of, of sadness and pain, uh, pray that the learning and the Torah and the mitzvahs uh, that we do here and in many other places should elevate his pure soul to the highest, highest level of Gan Eden, and that the family should have much comfort and strength in this time of great, great suffering. Our hearts are with them, and uh, we share in their pain if that gives them any measure of, of a little bit of, of comfort. Uh, in addition, uh, the sponsors tonight are the yard sites of uh, Frank Abramov, Ephraim Ben Yaakov Yitzchak, on the 12th of Tammuz, and Jane Abramov, Shana Yaffa, Bas Meisha Mordechai, and the 11th of Thomas. And uh, once two, the, the, the learning should be for an Aliyah for their Neshama. And finally, a Rafua Shlema to Chaya Shifra Bat Galila Yocheved and Galila Yocheved Bat Tevorah, who have been sponsors for uh, quite a few weeks already. On one hand, we're very grateful. On the other hand, we hope that they should get better. Bimeheira. And uh, they're always welcome to sponsor a share, but it shouldn't have to be for a Rafua Rafua Shlema. So we have Baruch Hashem, we have sponsors. Again, I apologize for being late, but in many, many ways, uh, I think it was appropriate for someone that has been such a uh, loyal supporter of, of Ibana in general, and this year in particular. Uh, the Parsha this week is the very, very interesting Parsha of uh, Balak. I'll tell you a little... I'm going to start off with a little bit of a humorous fort, although it is a fort, but it's a, it's a humorous fort. I had mentioned last week the Apter Rav, who was a great, great Hasidish Rebbe of the 19th century, who is called the Ohev Yisrael, the lover of Israel, because his book on Chumash is called the Ohev Yisrael. And the Apter Rav famously remarked that he could find allusions to loving fellow Jews in every parsha in the Torah. So somebody asked him, where do you find it in Balak? Now, in truth, I don't really hear the kasha. I mean, not Tovo, Balak himself, not Balak, Bilam himself praises Am Yisrael. But somebody asked, where do you find a direct reference to Avat Yisrael in Parshat Balak? So the Apsharav said, ah, oh, that's very, very simple. The very name of the Parsha, Balak, the vase is Vi Ahavta, the Lamed is Lereacha, and the kuf is kamocha. Love your friend as yourself. Balak is an abbreviation. So somebody said, Rebbe, with all due respect, via hafta is a vav, and balak is a vase or a bet. Lirayacha is lamed, okay. But kamocha is a chaf or a kaf, 
and this is a kuf. So two of the three letters don't match up at all. So the Abdur Rabbi said, Abdur Rabbi said, that's the point. When you have Avas Yisrael, you don't look so closely at things. <laughs> you learn to overlook. You learn to be a little more, you know, forgiving. Right? You want to be medayek. You want to be meticulous. You want to be exact. That's a contradiction to Avat Yisrael. Because when you look for negativity, you will always find it. You will always find something to criticize. But Avat Yisrael says, don't look so closely at what you might perceive as the flaws of people. So that's a little, little bit of an introductory joke. But the Parsha itself talks about the fact, now remember, chronologically, we are in the 40th year. The Tyra literally skips over 38 years from the Chedah Meraglim till the 40th year. We're not told anything that happened during that whole period of time. Now we're in the 40th year, and a lot of stuff happened in the 40th year. Miriam dies, and Aaron dies. Moshe will die later. And uh, then we have the whole story of Balak. And Balak is the king of the Moabites. And Balak is afraid of the Jewish people because they had conquered the lands of Sichon. And Balak hires a professional sorcerer, Bilam, whose curses are very efficacious. Right? Have curse, will travel. Bilam's curses seem to work. And he hires Bilam to curse B'nai Israel. And of course, as we know the story, Hashem turned all of Bilam's curses that he wanted to do, they were turned into blessings and brachos. So as a preliminary kasha, the Mepharshim asked the following. What is Balak afraid of? Hashem actually commands the Jewish people that they are not allowed to conquer Moabite territory. Moab is a descendant of Lot. And God gave that land east of the Jordan. Remember, the land that we conquered that was given to Ruvain God and half of Manasseh is not the land of Ammon and Moab. The land of Ammon and Moab is inviolate. We're not allowed to touch it. It was the land of Sichon, the king of the Amori, who is one of the seven nations of Canaan. It happens to be, the Torah itself tells me, that Sichon conquered that land from the king of Moab. But that's the whole point. Once Sichon conquered it, it is no longer Moabite territory, and we're able to take it. That's true. But Moabite territory itself, the Torah says, Al Totsaret Moab, do not wage any war against Moab, do not engage in Milchama because I have given this territory to the B'nai Lot as part of my covenant with Abraham. So if that's the case, Balak has absolutely nothing to be afraid of. Why is Balak afraid of B'nai Israel and he has to hire Bilam to curse them? One simple answer might be that perhaps Balak himself is not aware of the commandments that, that was given to Moshe about not waging war against Moab, so perhaps Balak is acting under a misunderstanding. But the Shem Mishmuel gives a beautiful answer, and the answer of the Shem Mishmuel is that Balak is not afraid that Am Yisrael is going to conquer his land. That's not going to happen. Balak is afraid of the Jews going into Eretz Yisrael. He doesn't want them to go into Eretz Israel. Why does that affect him? Because here is the thing. If we compare the spiritual existence of the Jewish people in the desert to the spiritual life they're going to have in Eretz Israel, you see a very important difference. The desert is a spiritual cocoon. The desert is an artificial environment of pure spirituality. The man, the bread, comes from heaven. There is a traveling well of water. There are clouds of glory. God's presence is open and obvious and clear and supernatural and undeniable. It is a total spiritual cocoon of Kedusha. Now that has its costs. When you live in the presence of God in such a tangible way, every misstep invites immediate response. You do a sin, you know, thousands of people can die because you're dealing with the revelation of God without the veils of concealment that are typical of the world that we live in. Right? This is the world of the Midbar, the 24-hour spiritual cocoon of pure Ruchnius, 
Kiddusha spirituality. When we come to Eretz Yisrael, life is going to be very different. There is not going to be the man. We're going to have to plant the crops. There's not going to be a traveling well. We're going to have to dig wells or rely on rainwater. There will not be clouds of glory. We will need an army. We'll have to fight. We'll have to build cities. We'll have to dig ditches. We will have to have lawyers and doctors and accountants and police and fire. Meaning we will be living in a world of concealment. We will be living in a world of hester panim. We will be living in a world in which we have to engage with materialism and Gashmiyat. So here is what the Shem Mishmuel says. Bolak is perfectly happy to have a nation living in a spiritual environment that is not connected to the real world. Because the fact that there's a Jewish nation that's devoted to God, that learns Torah, that is not a reproach to the immorality of Moab and other cultures because they could say, hey, the Jews are not living in the real world. They don't face the real problems of society. They don't have to deal with the issues that we have to face every day. So let them be holy. Let them be righteous. Let them be Kaddish. Their life is irrelevant to what we have to go through. But once Am Yisrael comes to Eretz Yisrael, and at least at their best, we're not always at our best, but at least at our best we demonstrate that even in a life of materialism and physicality and building societies and digging ditches and planting crops, there is still a Torah and a mitzvah and a morality and an ethic that becomes a reproach to all of the degenerate societies that don't live by the, at least the moral standards of at least the Noahide laws. And therefore, Balak is determined that the Jewish people should not enter Eretz Yisrael. And that's what he thought the curse would accomplish because he said, let him be this spiritual, disembodied entity in the desert which has no relevance to the real life of man. And that's what the Shem Mishmuel says, that in many, many ways, although you might think that life in Eretz Yisrael was inferior to the spiritual life of the desert, in fact, it's the other way around. The life of the desert is simply the school, the preparation, that we kind of absorb this pure spirituality to then be able to take it into the gritty details of everyday life. Sanctifying the Gashmiyat, sanctifying the material, is even a higher level than the pure spirituality of disengagement from the material. If the Midbar represents disengagement from the physical building of a society, Eretz Yisrael represents transformation of that society to holiness and Kedusha. And that is even a greater challenge. But to the degree that we could successfully meet that challenge, that would be a reproach and a musar to all of those degenerate cultures. So this is how the Shem Shmuel understands why Balak wanted to hire Bilam. Now let's look at Bilam a little bit. How would we describe Bilam? Right? What's Bilam's character? So the truth of the matter is, we have three different prisms through which we examine this complex character that we call Bilam, because he's really a composite of three different personality types. Type one is Bilam was a Navi with extraordinary clarity of vision and understanding of God. Ad Kedekach, that the Medrash actually tells us that the nations of the world would have complained to God and they would have said, if you would have given us a prophet as great as Moshe, we too would be righteous. So God acceded to that request and gave them a prophet who on some levels was as great as Moshe. And that prophet was Bilaam. Bilaam was a prophet of greatness, of depth. Now, you could ask an interesting kasha on that. Well, wait a second here. 
This is a non sequitur. The nations say to God, or they would say to God, we, we have no historical evidence, they actually said it, but God was forestalling an ar argument they would have made. If you would give us somebody like Moshe, we would be righteous. So God gives them Bilam and they're not righteous. Okay, but they could just repeat the question. If you would give us a Moshe, we would be righteous. You're answering that by giving us a Bila? Right? What's going on? That's not, that's not an answer. The answer is this. Moshe and Bilaam are actually the same. Meaning to say, God gave Moshe tremendous prophetic powers. And God gave Bilaam tremendous prophetic powers. God did not make Moshe righteous. And God did not make Bilaam evil. But you have to understand the dynamics of having tremendous power. Everyone knows the old aphorism in politics, Lord Acton's statement, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Well, imagine how this works when you have divine power. Imagine you wake up one day and you have the power to bless, the power to curse, the power to build, the power to destroy. You simply say, let this building collapse, the building collapses. You're given this godlike power. What happens to you at that point? Well, what had happened was, when Bilaam got that power, it turned his head. It made him arrogant. It made him evil. It made him selfish. It made him egotistical. Moshe took that power and used it to serve God and remain humble. So yeah, if the Umos Olam say, if you would have given us someone like Moshe, we would be good. God gave them somebody who was like Moshe. The fact that that Moshe-like person became Bilaam is no different than the fact that the Bilaam-like person became Moshe. That's a function of free will. God didn't give the Umos a bad prophet and give the Jewish people a good prophet. He gave them two people, both of whom had the potential for greatness, and both of whom had the potential for evil. So image number one we have of Bilaam is a tremendous, tremendous prophet. And when I say prophet, I don't, I don't only mean the ability to see the future, but the ability to effect things, the ability to say things that just happened. Like magic. That's version number one. Bilam, the great prophet of the Umota Olam, like Moshe Rabbeinu is the great prophet to the Jewish people. Aspect number two. Bilam is the cool, collected, cynical profession. Professional. Have curse, will travel. Think about the three-piece suit lawyer who will represent any type of case. He'll take any side of the case. Bilaam was a mercenary. Bilaam had tremendous power and Bilaam hired out his abilities to whomever paid the highest price. Indeed, one could have argued that if the Jewish people would have paid Bilaam to curse Moab, he would have done that. A man without ideology, a man without any moral stature, a man without any foundation. A mercenary who had no sense of any ethical grounding whatsoever. In fact, some want to say, even his name suggests that. Bil Am could be a contraction for Bali Am, a man that had no nation, a man that had no loyalties, a man that had no foundation. The mercenary who hires out his talent to whomever pays the highest price. So think about whatever it would be, the cool, collected, professional who really has no sense of morality at all. That is the second view of Bilaam. First view is exalted prophet of God. Second view is a cool, cynical mercenary with no moral core. The third view of Bilaam 
is he was a train wreck beyond control. A person addicted to power, to arrogance, to selfishness, to egotism. A person who was not in control of himself because these passions ruled him. Let me point out an interesting observation of the Chavetz Chaim. We know in the Torah that we have paragraph divisions. If you ever get an Aliyah, you'll see this. But even in the Ars Kol Chomish, it gets marked. In other words, uh, the Torah is divided into paragraphs. There are two types of divisions. Uh, some parshiot, some paragraphs, are called stumot, closed. That actually means the next paragraph begins on the same line after a break of nine, the space of nine letters. Other times, a paragraph might end in the middle of the line and you will begin the next paragraph on the next line. That's called an open paragraph because the last line is left vacant. These are psuchot or stumot. In a printed chumash, it'll say pei when it means petucha and say samach when it means stuma. By the way, these are quite important halachically. Even though it doesn't change the meaning of any verse, because it doesn't change the words of the Torah. If a Torah is not written with the proper psuchot and stumot, the Torah is puzzle. So this is mamish, a very, very important matter halakhically to get the psuchot and the stumot kasher, even though it's only paragraph divisions. Now normally the Torah is divided into paragraphs. Every parsha is divided into paragraphs. In Parshas Balak, the whole story of Balak trying to curse us and God turning it into a blessing is one unbroken block of text with no division into psuchot and stumot. Very unusual. Why are there no psuchot or stumot, at least in the first part of Parshas Balak, which is Bilam's prophecies? So the Chavitz Chaim explains that the Gemara itself tells us what is the theological significance of paragraph divisions. So the Gemara says that when Hashem would speak to Moshe, he would give Moshe breaks in the middle so Moshe could think about what he was learning and then Hashem would go on. In other words, a psuchar stuma indicates quite literally that God was giving Moshe a break, a coffee break. If it's a stuma, it's a shorter coffee break. If it's a petucha, it's a longer coffee break. Now the Chavitz Chaim is masber. This is a bit subtle. That the idea of a coffee break doesn't mean Moshe has had a coffee break. Right? <laughs> it doesn't mean he needed to take a nap. But rather, Moshe Rabbeinu had other things to do in his life other than talk to God. He couldn't just talk to God all day. He was a leader of a nation. He had to answer Shilas. He had to pray for Am Yisrael. So the revach ben advekim, meaning the space between the parshiot, enabled Moshe to navigate, multitask, navigate back and forth between his spiritual communion with God and all of the other responsibilities he had as leader. So Moshe learns from God. And then Moshe answers people's shilas or prays for them or gives them comfort or gives them chizuk. And then he goes back. The Chavitz Chaim says, the ability to navigate from one thing to another can only work successfully if you regard all of those activities as part of the same thing. Meaning the following. If you view your whole life as service to God, then when I stop my learning to give staka. When I stop my learning to give somebody chizuk, I'm not interrupting what I'm doing. I am simply doing my job in a different way. So the revach ben advekim from Moshe Rabbeinu was not a break in continuity. It was part of the same continuum. Because all of the non-speaking to God activities of Moshe Rabbeinu we're also part of Avodah Hashem. So the Revach Ben Advekim basically means Moshe could move in and out of revelation. 
No, in one moment he has a revelation from God, in another moment he's answering a shaila. In one moment Hashem is giving a mitzvah, in another moment Moshe Rabbeinu is davening. This was not in and out, because all of this was the same continuum. Rav Moshe Feinstein is a more modern example. Rav Moshe Feinstein uh, spent most of his free time, to the degree he had free time, writing his chuvos, his famous responsa. Now Rav Moshe's responsa are notoriously complex. When people look at Igras Moshe, and for, unfortunately many people don't even learn the chuvos, they're too hard. Uh, they look at the shaila. what's the question? And then they look at the last uh, line, what the answer is. That's right, they want to know. Ramosha Matras, Ramosha Asras. But all of the reasoning is very, very complicated. Now usually, when we're involved in something very, very complicated, and we have to, we get interrupted, it takes a long time to get back into something. You're writing a paper, and you're developing a subtle point, a difficult point, a complicated point. And then you have to take your uh, son to a soccer game. Maybe I'm using American examples here. Or you have to drop off the cleaning, or you have to run carpool. And that takes up an hour of your time, or an hour and a half of your time, or two hours of your time. And then you get back to that complicated paper. It's not going to be that easy to do. Again, I'm, I'm, I can speak about this from personal experience. To get into something again. So how could Moshe move back and forth? When maybe Moshe Rabbeinu spent hours on non-divine communication. Now with Ramosha Feinstein, the way it worked was, Ramosha Feinstein was interrupted constantly. People would come with their own shilas. They would come with life crises. They would come with, they needed chizuk. They were suffering bereavements, sicknesses, illnesses. And he would stop and he would give you all the time you needed. That was one of the great characteristics of Ramosha. You never felt you were taking up his time. He had all the time in the world for you. And he would cry with you if you were going through a difficult time. And he would empathize with you and give you all the time you wanted. One hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. And after the four hours, when he had stopped in the middle of an intricate, complicated tshuva, he was able to continue in the middle of a word and just continue writing without any preliminary preparation. How could that be? Once you get out of it, how do you get back into it? And the answer was, he never got out of it. Because even the activities that were not his learning were part of his service to God. And therefore, the psuchos and the stumos indicate this ability to move back and forth because everything is a continuum. Now, with Bilam, the Chavitz Chaim says, the opposite was the case. Bilam had two modalities in life. Bilam had a prophetic modality when he was somehow connected to God and he was ecstatic and he was uh, suffused with prophecy and inspiration. And Bilam had his materialistic, selfish, egotistical side. When Bilam was in prophetic mode, he couldn't shut it off. Because Bilam was a creature of whatever mode and mood took him over at the time. So when he was a prophet, he kept on going. And when he was not in prophetic mode, he kept on going as well. So it's not Shaykh with Bilam to interrupt his prophecies when he goes into his other mode because once he's in prophetic mode he can't stop and if he stopped he wouldn't be able to get back into it. As the Chavitz Chaim points out that Bilam was a slave to whatever emotional states grabbed hold of him at any given time. That's why there are no psuchis. There's no revach bein advekim. Because once he leaves the prophetic mode, he can't get back into it. Because these are not points on a continuum. These are simply opposites. 
And the opposites are not reconcilable. So Bekitzer, once again, to go over this, there are three prisms through which we view the personality of Bilaam. The great prophet, the cool mercenary without ethical values, and the runaway train wreck who is totally, uh, totally in control of, or totally controlled rather by whatever emotions are grabbing him at the moment. As an extra dimension of the tragedy of Bilaam, and again, I use tragedy in the Greek sense. We talked about this with Korach. There's an overlap here. The Greek idea of tragedy is not if a building falls on top of you, that's very sad. But the Greek idea of tragedy is when you are destroyed by a flaw within your own character. That is tragedy. Bilaam had greatness. But Bilaam was destroyed by the fact that his emotions, his passions, were uncontrollable. They pulled him in every possible direction. And that destroyed him. What makes it even worse is Bilaam was smart enough to know this about himself. Bilaam was not oblivious. Sometimes oblivion can be a source of comfort for you. In other words, I don't know how bad I am. Bilaam knew exactly. And this brings me to the point of how he wanted to curse B'nai Yisrael. This is from the Chassam Sofer. Listen to this very interesting point. The Gemara in Brachos discusses what was Bilaam's great power to curse? Why were Bilaam's curses so efficacious? So the Gemara in Brachos says there is a split second of the day when Hashem has anger and fury on the world. It's just a split second. And if you know when that is, and you curse in that split second, it's like you're pushing the nuclear button. And that releases a tremendous amount of fury in the world. And Bilaam knew exactly, this is called in the Gemara, Idan Rischa. In Aramaic that means the moment of anger. The Gemara says you can actually know when that is, and that is a rooster that has a red comb, there's a split second it turns white. And that's the Eden Rizcha. The Gemara says Rabbi Meir had enemies, and he wanted to curse his enemies. So he decided to tie a chicken, or a rooster, to the foot of his bed, and he would stare at the rooster. And the moment he would see it white, he knew when to go. Of course, I'm not sure how that could ever work because blinking would already miss it. But the Gemara says the Rebbe fell asleep. He was not able to. And he realized it's not Hashem's desire that we use curses. But Bilaam knew. By the way, what, what's the purpose of that? Uh, why would there be a reason that there's a second of the day where there's total din and not rachamim in the world? So Rabbi, Rabbi Gedal Yashar says, that that is what puts the fear of God into people. Meaning to say that most people, even Goyim, most people have a basic sense of morality. I mean, unless you're psychotic or sociopath, I mean, most people understand it's wrong to kill, it's wrong to steal. And they feel that, you know, they're going to get punished somehow if they break these laws. There's kind of a natural fear of God that people have, what gives us that fear is that little split second in which the universe is suffused with Midat Hadin. So even though the rest of the day, Rachamim is by far the dominant component, but the Rasham, the impression of that Eden Rizcha, is what gives us the fear of God. In fact, the Gemara Bracho says what happened basically was that that particular day, the reason why Bilaam couldn't curse is because Hashem canceled the Eden Rizcha. So Bilaam is cursing, cursing, cursing. It's like he's pushing a button that's not connected. It's not connected. 
Hashem canceled it that day. Okay, in fact, that actually explains what Dalia Shor says. That explains Bilaam's plan B. If you remember what happened. Bilaam tried to curse B'nai Yisrael three times. And every single time, it turned into a blessing. Balak is understandably upset. And Balak says, you know, get out of here, you're a bum. And Bilaam does come up with a plan B. Bilaam says, well, I can't curse them, but I'll give you something else to do. Let's get the women of Moab to entice them to fornication and idolatry. And God doesn't like that. And in truth, Bilaam was kind of successful in that one. 24,000 people died as a result of a plague because they gave in to the fornication and the idolatry. And more would have died had Pinchas not rose to be zealous for the glory of God. So plan A was Bilaam would curse. When the curse didn't work, we have the plan B of being machshil them in the sin. Rav Gedal Yeshua says these two things work in tandem. This is really very interesting. Because if Bilaam sees he can't curse B'nai Yisrael, he's pushing the button and the button is not connected. That's because God took off the Idun Rizcha, the moment of anger. Now, if the function of the moment of anger is to create the inhibitions we have against sin, Bilaam is a smart cookie. If Hashem took away the Eden Rizcha, that actually means the normal inhibitions the Jewish people would have against sinning, they don't have today because that fear of God is not present. Therefore, Bilaam says, they are especially prone to enticement for sin. So Bilaam kind of is a master manipulator because when he sees that plan A doesn't work, he says, then Badafka, plan B is going to work, as indeed it did work. Okay. Now, Tosos asked the Kasha like this, going back to the Gemara. Bilaam's great success was that he knew the Eden Rizcha. But the Eden Rizcha is very short in duration. What can you say in the Eden Rizcha that's going to be an effective curse? Because by the time you say it, you know, the time has passed. So Tosos gives two answers. One answer is a technical answer that the Eden Rizcha just means if you begin your curse in the right time, you're allowed to keep on going. Hashem keeps the window open once you began your curse. If you got to the beginning of your curse in the window, Hashem keeps the window open. Some want to say, if Gal Yeshua brings, this is Derech Drush, that this might be the justification of some in the Hasidic movement who say that as long as you begin davening before the end of the Zman, you could finish your davening afterwards because if you see for curses, if you begin your curse within the time, you're allowed to extend it afterwards. Kal v'chomer for good things, Hashem is going to give you the same prerogative. If you have that option for negative things, Hashem will surely give you that option for positive things. Okay, that's the first answer of Tosos. Now then Tosos gives a second answer that there is in fact a curse that you would be able to bring in even within the time. And that is the two-syllable word kalem. Kalem is kaf. Chaf, lamad bem. Destroy them. Kalem. You can get it in under a second. Right? That would have been, that would have been the curse that Bilaam would have wanted to use except for the fact that it didn't work. So the Chassam Seifer says the following idea. The Chassam Seifer says B'derech Drush that Kalem could actually be, be an abbreviation. The Chaf could be Kaved which is liver. The Lamed is lave which is heart, and the mem is moach, which is the mind, which is the intellectual and moral sense of a human being. Kaved, liver, is understood by Chazal, although we don't necessarily connect it that way in modern anatomy, 
with the seed of passion and desire. Lev is emotion. Moach is your moral and intellectual understanding of the purpose of life. Kalem, when is a person destroyed? When their passions and emotions rule over their mind. Meaning, when my decisions are driven by my passions, by my yearnings, by my desires, and I use my mind to simply give me the means to indulge in my hedonistic lusts, I am destroying myself as a person. So based on the Chazam Seifer, the curse that Bilaam wanted to give the Jewish people, which Tosva says is the word kalem, is essentially the curse. May you be like me. Bilaam himself, a man of phenomenal intelligence and spiritual insight. But Bilaam was controlled as if by a demonic force with egotism and selfishness and jealousy and taiva, and the desire for covered. But Bilaam is aware of the tragedy of his own existence. He's aware of it. He's aware of how awful it is to have so much ability. And you just can't harness it in positive ways. Because the taiva and the ego are so addictive that you can't break out. So when he would curse I'm Israel or anyone else. The curse is, may you have what I have. May you have the disease that I have. May you be a person whose passions and desires and typhus control and direct and take over like a virus, like a bacterium. Right? They have these viruses that kind of are parasitic. They take over the nervous system. Right? Bilam, the kina, the taiva, and the kavod, they hijack the intellectual and moral sensibilities of a person. But Bilam was not oblivious to this. And the curse of Kalem is exactly that. The opposite of Kalem, same letters, Melech. Instead of Kalayot, Lev, Moach, Melech, king, is Moach, Lev, Kilayot. Either Kilayot or Kalbet. In other words, uh, it's, in, it's in both versions. Some say the Chaf are the kidneys, which are also a seat of sexual passion. Others say it's the liver, which is considered to be the seat of material desires. So Kilayot or Kalbet, you'll see both versions. But the point is, Melech is the opposite of Kalbet. What's the message here? Who is a king? A king is a person whose mind controls and directs the passions and the yearnings and the desires. Now, this does not mean that one is supposed to be an automaton in which you're controlled only by your brain like the, the guy in Star Trek, uh, Mr. Spock, I have to be careful, I always say Dr. Spock, uh, but Dr. Spock is the baby doctor, that's somebody else. Uh, Mr. Spock was a very brilliant guy, but he did not have a PhD or an MD. So it's Mr. Spock, not Dr. Spock, but Mr. Spock, right, had no emotions, no feelings, everything was the mind. That's not what a Jew is about. A Jew should feel deeply, a Jew should love, a Jew should, should have joy, a Jew should have sadness when it's time to be sad. We are supposed to be people of feeling and not just cogitation. But the feelings have to be directed by the higher faculties of man, the intellect and the morality that are in the Moach. And then a person is a king. If your kaved and your lave control your mind, kalem, you are being destroyed. 
if your mind controls your feelings and emotions and directs them and channels them in good and productive ways, you are a melech, you are a king. And that is why you find the word melech used over and over in Bilaam's blessings. Because what does the Torah say? The Torah literally says, Hashem reversed Bilaam's curse to a bracha. The Yafei Hashem killas Bilaam levracha. The Chesam Sefer says, this is quite literal. Bilaam wanted to say kalem, and Hashem converted it into the blessing of Melech. Okay? And uh, this is the idea. The idea here is that there are many types of addictions. Of course, addiction has a technical, scientific, medical context. And you could say that the average person is not addicted. Yeah, and again, that may be true if you have a particular technical definition of addiction. But how many of us, and I, I include myself, we are such creatures of whatever mood happens to grab us. When we're upset, you know, then no matter what, we can't get out of that. And yet, the highest level is that your mind tells you what is the appropriate feeling at this point. When it's joy, I feel joy. When it's sadness, I feel sadness. I always focus on what the Torah is commanding me. What is Hashem's will at any given situation, any given moment in time? And that is what it means to be a melech. And that is what it means when it says Hashem converted Bilaam's curse into a bracha. You know, we know that the greatest gift of a human being that Hashem gave to a human being is free will. Bechira. We have the capacity to choose. And when you ask a person, what does it mean to have free will? So people will say, well, I can choose to do whatever I want. But the truth of the matter is, that's a very big mistake. True Bechira is the ability to choose what I don't want to do. Because to choose what I want to do at any given moment, that is what an animal can do. When an animal wants to eat, it eats. Human free will is the override system that says, I'm not a creature of whatever emotion happens to grab me at a given moment in time. A Baal Bechira can Badafka decide not to do what they would really like to do or to do what they really don't want to do. Right? So if I feel angry at somebody, I want to punch them in the face, a Baal Bechira can still decide, I'm not going to do that. It's not right. So we make a big mistake when we define Bechira in terms of doing what I want to do, because that's simply letting the taiva control you, like the virus that takes over your nervous system. The Baal Bechira is Badafka, the override capacity in the human being that can delay gratification, that can decide not to do what it wants to do, that can decide not to lash out even when I'm angry. And that is the great, great gift that Hashem has given uh, the, the human being. You know, we're about to enter uh, the three-week periods starting on Sunday, the 17th of Tammuz, the three weeks during the year when we formally and officially mourn the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. And Rav Tzadok points out that the reason why there are three weeks of mourning, Shiva Zohar Tammuz Tisha B'Av, is because there are three negative midot that spiritually destroy the Beis HaMikdash. They are jealousy, kina, envy, taiva, excessive lust, and hedonism, and kavod, a desire for honor and ego gratification. And since in these three weeks our goal is to try to rebuild the Beis HaMikdash in our hearts, because only after we rebuild the Beis HaMikdash in our hearts and our souls 
when we get the Beis HaMikdash from the Shemayim. So the three weeks we're designed to try to work on eradicating from our heart the Kina, the Taiva, and the Kavat. Those three destroyers of the temple. Get rid of the junk. Right before you build a building, you have to clean the building site of all of the garbage. The kinna of Taiva Vakavite is the garbage that prevents the building of the Beis Mikdash in our hearts. These were the Midot of Bilam. Bilam was controlled by them. We have to work in the opposite direction to become a Melech over these Midot. And then we are Zaycha to Geula. So may this period of time be a time of healing, be a time of comfort, be a time of strength. May we be Zaycha to rebuild the Beis HaMikdash in our hearts and our souls. And in that way be Zaycha to the actual Beis HaMikdash coming down Min HaShemayim. And may it be B'mei Revi Amen. Amen. Thank you.